Susie Muir from UCLA Radiology, Los Angeles, California. Podcast number 17 is to be presented by Dr. Sharif Riyad. The topic is brain calcifications in the pediatric population. Hello, this is Dr. Sharif Riyad, and I will be presenting brain calcifications in the pediatric population. This is by no means an exhaustive review. Rather, it is meant to present some of the more commonly encountered pathologies in the pediatric population. Calcifications that occur in the body outside of normally calcified structures are ectopic calcifications. Broadly defined, there are two types of ectopic calcifications. There are metastatic calcifications, which arise within normal tissues in the setting of abnormal calcium homeostasis. And there are dystrophic calcifications, which arise within damaged or necrotic tissues. Dystrophic calcifications account for more than 90% of the ectopic calcifications that we encounter. Usually, calcium in dystrophic calcifications takes the form of hydroxyapatites, which is the same form found in bone. Some examples from the adult brain include cases of vascular dementia, Parkinson's disease, epilepsy, and brain tumors such as astrocytomas. These are post-mortem samples demonstrating calcium staining in the human brain. Brain calcifications can either be physiologic or pathologic. This distinction can depend in part on the age of the patient. Structures in the adult brain which often demonstrate physiologic calcifications include the choroid plexus, the pineal gland, the basal ganglia, vascular structures, and the meninges. But the choroid plexus is not normally calcified in children, and it is only calcified in about 5% of adolescents. While most adults will have choroid plexus calcifications by the age of 40, In the pineal gland, only 2% of children less than 8 will show calcifications. 1 in 10 adolescents will demonstrate calcifications, and by age 30, nearly every adult has calcifications in their pineal gland. The basal ganglia, which often demonstrates calcifications in adults over 30, is rarely calcified in children. Seeing calcifications in the basal ganglia should suggest either perinatal infection or an underlying metabolic disorder. The meninges, or the dura, are virtually never calcified in children, and findings of dural calcifications should at least prompt consideration of the diagnosis of basal cell nevus syndrome. However, in children who have undergone shunting or who have received radiation may demonstrate calcifications of the dura at an earlier age. Non-physiologic calcifications in the adult brain include those occurring in tumors and those occurring in post-hemorrhagic brain tissue. Categories of disease which lead to calcifications of the pediatric brain include congenital infections and acquired infections, genetic disorders and metabolic disorders, and in post-hemorrhagic brain and in tumors, Post-hemorrhagic calcifications include those found in neonatal hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy. Case 1A, we have two axial CT images through the lateral ventricles which demonstrate extensive periventricular calcifications which are more or less symmetric in distribution. Case 1B is a companion case which also demonstrates periventricular calcifications Note that these calcifications are not nearly as extensive nor as symmetric as in the preceding case. In addition, there are calcifications elsewhere in the brain, including within the basal ganglia and at the gray-white junction. Periventricular and basal ganglia calcifications are characteristic of torch infections. Torch infections are congenital infections and include toxoplasmosis, rubella, CMV, and herpes simplex 1 and 2. HIV and syphilis should be considered as well. Let's review the answers for case 1. Case 1A was a case of CMV. CMV is the most common of the torch infections, resulting in symmetric paraventricular calcifications. Case 1B was toxoplasmosis. 
The calcifications in toxoplasmosis are less symmetric than in CMV. They occur in the periventricular regions as well as in the basal ganglia and cerebral hemispheres. Toxoplasmosis results in enlargement of the posterior aspects of the lateral ventricles. This enlargement of the posterior lateral ventricles is described as colpocephaly-like. Colpocephaly is a term that is generally used to describe the appearance of the lateral ventricles in cases of agenesis of the corpus callosum. Moving on to case two, here we have two axial CT images demonstrating gyriform calcifications in the right hemisphere. The patient in case two may bear some resemblance to Mikhail Gorbachev. You'll note the port wine stain on Mikhail Gorbachev's forehead specifically in the ophthalmic division of the trigeminal nerve, which is a characteristic cutaneous feature in persons with this disease. This disease, if you haven't guessed, is Sturge-Weber syndrome, also known as encephalotrigeminal angiomatosis. Now, I in no way am implying that Mikhail Gorbachev had this disease. The gyriform calcifications we just saw normally occur on the same side as the port wine stain and occur within areas of peel angiomatosis. In case 3, we have two axial CT images. This patient demonstrates calcifications within the brain. This case pretty much reduces to a test of anatomy if you correctly localize these calcifications to the cella tersica, then it is not too difficult to conclude that these likely represent calcifications within a craniopharyngioma. In case 4, we have an axial CT image from a 19-year-old Egyptian male who presents with a hyperdense mass in the right basal ganglia. This disease is rare in the United States, but is responsible for up to one-third of brain masses in the developing world. The most common CNS manifestation of this pathogen is meningitis. This is a case of tuberculosis resulting in a tuberculoma. In case 5, we have an axial CT image demonstrating a parenchymal calcification. Then we have two MR images. The first is a flare image demonstrating a region of flare hyperintensity with a central region of hypointensity corresponding to the calcification on CT. The next MR image is a T1 post contrast image which shows some enhancement associated with this lesion. Here we have a cone down CT image demonstrating edema associated with a parenchymal calcification. The final CT image from another patient demonstrates calcifications throughout the brain, some associated with edema in the bilateral frontal lobes. If you use your imagination, you might say that these calcifications look like a starry sky. So this is a case of neurosister sarcosis. These calcifications represent the old residua of a larval parasite which lives in the brain and then dies. When it dies, it causes an inflammatory reaction, and these inflammatory foci within the brain serve as the nidises for seizure activity. This is Tinea solium, the pig tapeworm. Normally, Humans play the role of definite host to this parasite, and it lives in our intestines. When we make the mistake of eating the eggs of Tinea solium, we become the intermediate host, which is a role normally played by the pig. With humans as the intermediate host, the eggs and larval forms take up residence in various body tissues, including the brain. The encapsulated cystic structures can be asymptomatic for up to 10 years, in case 6, we have two axial T2-weighted MR images. The first demonstrates bilateral subappendable nodules. The central T2 hypointensity within these nodules is consistent with calcifications. And the second image demonstrates cortical and subcortical T2 hyperintensity in the bilateral cerebral hemispheres. And this is a classic case of tuberous sclerosis. Case 7 will be our final case. A 16-year-old girl presents with a first-time seizure. Her medical history is significant for portal hypertension, secondary to a congenital portal venous malformation. 
These are images from the patient's head CT scrolling from top to bottom. We see calcifications throughout the brain. We'll go through that one more time. Calcifications in the parenchyma, in the periventricular regions of the basal ganglia, and throughout the cerebellum. Unfortunately, I do not know the final diagnosis in case 7. What I can offer is a differential diagnosis, which was born in a mind far greater than my own. Symmetric periventricular calcifications and basal ganglia calcifications should make us consider congenital torch infections as a potential cause. There is an entity known as familial idiopathic non-arteriosclerotic cerebral calcifications, which is an exceedingly rare heritable disorder associated with pulmonary complications and liver disease, both of which incidentally were present in this patient. Another rare entity that we hear about in radiology is FAR disease, which is also known as familial idiopathic basal ganglia calcifications. The appearance of the brain in FAR disease is very similar to the brain we saw here. However, the age group of FAR disease is 30 to 60 years, and this patient was 16, making FAR disease unlikely. Extensive brain calcifications have been described in patients with venous congestion. Venous congestion can arise from large AV fistulas. It can also arise in cases of portal hypertension. The pediatric radiology literature describes cases of extensive brain calcifications in patients with dural AV fistulas and in patients with anomalous intracranial venous drainage. That brings us to the close of this podcast. I must give my thanks first and foremost to Dr. Susie Meir, without whom none of this would exist, whose passion for knowledge and teaching is without rival, and whose mentorship has been the greatest, most unexpected gift. I would also like to thank Dr. Noriko Solomon, who lent her expertise and furnished many of the images used in this podcast. Her vast mind is a universe unto its own. Finally, I'd like to thank the University of California, Los Angeles, and the Department of Radiology for encouraging and supporting its residents in endeavors such as this. Please visit our Pediatric Imaging Wiki site, http pediatricimaging.wikispaces.com, for additional podcasts and also interesting pediatric and adult cases in all imaging specialties.